It is our customary to spend the next few uh, moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege, opportunity, and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Satan has a strategy to put the believer in the cosmic system. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John 3, verse 4. 1 John 3, 4. Last night we studied uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 18. And that is also part of Satan's strategy to put the believer in the cosmic system. We noted the double advance or the uh, the uh, double advance column to the loser believer status, and that is how you do that. First John two fifteen through eighteen, loving the world. First John three four through twelve gives us more indication that it is Satan's plan to put the believer in the cosmic system. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. And you know that Jesus was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Of course, in Jesus Christ there is no sin. 3.6 Everyone who resides in him does not sin. That is, everyone who resides in the divine dinosphere does not sin. Everyone who sins has neither seen him or known seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. At the moment when anyone is born from God, at the moment that anyone is born from God, that means at regeneration through faith in Jesus Christ. At the moment that we are born from God, He is not sinning. When you believe in Christ, you are thrust into the divine dynosphere, the divine power sphere, and you are not sinning. And when you do, then you have rebound. But as soon as you believe in Christ, for whatever time afterwards whether it be a short time or a longer time, you are not sinning. As it is impossible to sin inside the divine dinosphere, because his seed, his seed is talking about the believer. His seed, the believer, keeps residing in it. Because his seed, the believer, keeps residing in it. In what? The love complex, the divine dinosphere. Now, in the English, you will not see anything from this. In the English, you'll turn into a legalist. This comes out in the Greek. And when we study 1 John 3, 4 through 12, and when we study 1 John, we'll go in more detail about it. But right now, I'm just showing you that it is Satan's strategy to put you in the cosmic system. And these verses aren't referring to sin as such. They're referring to the fact the believer in the cosmic system or the believer outside the cosmic system, and that's it. The believer does sin. First John himself wrote that. First John one eight and first John one ten. So we do sin. And for you to come out and read this in the English and say, There you go, believers don't sin means the Bible contradicts itself and it doesn't. The Bible never contradicts itself. And legalists pull this out because they think every scripture deals with salvation and it doesn't. Every scripture doesn't deal with salvation. Some scriptures deal with salvation. Some scriptures deal with post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. Some scriptures deal with whether you're living inside the cosmic system or outside of it in the divine dinosphere. And that's what 1 John 3, 4 through 12 is teaching us. And you will not get it in the English. Impossible. 
you got to know the Greek. Because his seed, believers, keep residing in it, the divine dinosphere. Furthermore, he is not able to sin. Who is not able to sin? The one who is residing in the divine dinosphere. When you are filled with the Spirit, you are not able to sin. Or able not to sin. Let's put it that way. When you're living in the divine dinosphere, you are able not to sin. For a while. And then 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10 take over. In which you have an old sin nature and you will succumb to the temptation and you will sin. But when you're in the divine dinosphere, you're not sinning. And uh, most people don't live in the divine dinosphere. Most believers keep on sinning all the time, and they're still believers, and they're still going to heaven. In this passage, my, I might have, should not just throw this passage at you right now until we studied First John. But anyway, three ten. By this, the children of God and the disciples of the devil are revealed. Everyone who does not practice righteousness, living in the divine dinosphere, the one who does not love his fellow Christian, the love complex inside the divine dinosphere, number seven and eight, the integrity envelope, is not of God. And believers have been uh, stated by the Apostle Paul as being the enemies of Jesus Christ. Is not of God means they are not functioning inside of God's divine dinosphere. One day we'll study First John and we'll get it. We don't have time to go through that now. Right now I'm just giving you a verse that tells you that Satan has a strategy to keep the believer in the cosmic system. And these verses deal with the cosmic system and divine dinosphere. If you've listened to First John by the Colonel, you know that. So Satan's strategy include number one. He accuses the believers of sin. Number one, he accuses the believers of sin. You know what that means? We do sin. So he accuses us. And if uh, we are high ranking, that is if we're up in player all my and we sin, and Satan sees it personally, he's going to make an accusation. Just like he did with Job. So he accuses believer of sin, the believers of sin, and therefore being under his control. We see, we see that in Job chapter 1, 6 through 11, when Job was accused. Zechariah 3, 1 through 2 also explains this. Zechariah 3, 1 through 2, Revelation 12, 9 through 10. However, Jesus Christ defends us in heaven. When Satan accuses us of sin, big whoop, it's been dealt with on the cross. So Jesus Christ defends us in heaven and says, Well, I already dealt with that sin. Seems like after a while Satan would give up, but he doesn't. So every time he accuses, Jesus Christ says, I died as a substitute for that sin. I died as a substitute for that sin. And he'll come up and say, Ah, look at your believers. That believer there committed a sin. And Jesus Christ will say, Ah, I died for that sin. <laughs> and that's it. Nothing else to it. But he keeps doing it. And Jesus Christ defends us in heaven. That's found in 1 John 2, 1 through 2. Now, if 1 John 3, 4 through 12 was teaching that believers don't sin, and that's where ignorant pastors who don't know the original languages and who don't know straight up from straight down would say, then why in the world would Jesus Christ have to defend us? 1 John 2, 1 through 2. If after you believe in Christ you're perfect, we would not be, need to be defended. But after you believe in Christ, you know we're not perfect. Anderson, well, if believers did not sin, Anderson would be millennium. All the believers that are here, <laughs> it would be phenomenal. Good Samaritans everywhere. Nobody's sinning. It'd be a wonderful place to live. But it's not, because there's a bunch of believers here who are sinners! And that's just the way it is. And any legalist that picks up on this one passage and tries to twist it around using nothing but the English language and see, say there, see there? It says, you're not going to sin. If you're of God, you don't sin. And these same people aren't of God in the divine dynasphere. They're following Satan's strategy. 
They don't even know what it's talking about. Clueless. Absolutely clueless. Otherwise, 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10 wouldn't have been written. Neither would have 1 John 2, verse 1 through 2. But try to explain that to a legalist and you'll have your work cut out for you. Point two, Satan sponsors reversionism. We've noted reversionism and its eight categories. Satan sponsors reversionism and all principles related to Christian degeneracy. Satan sponsors reversionism and all principles related to Christian degeneracy. Someone uh, wrote me and told me that almost every doctrinal church I don't know if it's true this is what this fellow told me he said that uh, Joe Griffin's church when he taught Satanology there was a split he also told me that uh, when uh, Pete Daughtry started teaching Satanology there was a split and he went through a list of them and said yep they split here and there every time Satanology was taught and I know why because suddenly people begin to realize you're either in one system or the other and then they realize I'm in the wrong system and it irritates them because it, it, it really does bring out and it shows that there's no in between you're either in God's system in the divine dinosphere or you're in the devil's system having all his composites all his composites of deception and I went through all of those verses and people could see themselves in those verses deceitful people and they looked at themselves in the mirror and screamed and ran out and they and it's all about violence and some of them looked in the mirror and screamed about that and they saw about relative righteousness and how superficial it is and they looked in the mirror and they screamed about that and they and they looked at the fact that well uh, they looked at all sorts of things and they finally came to the conclusion well this can't be right what's so funny they and they came to the conclusion that they just uh, they must be right in this situation and so Satan sponsors reversionism and he sponsors all principles related to Christian degeneracy number three Satan sponsors fear Satan sponsors fear no reason for a believer to ever be afraid especially of flying or anything else. Flying is the safest mode of transportation. But Satan sponsors fear and anger to distract the believer from the protocol plan of God. If you walk around mad all the time, you're not in fellowship. You're not functioning under the protocol plan of God found in Hebrews 2 14 through 15 Hebrews 2 14 through 15 but Satan sponsors fear and anger to distract the believer from the protocol plan of God fear we have not been given the power of fear we have not been given a spirit of fear or timidity but of power filling of the Holy Spirit and when you go under fear you're not filled with the Spirit and anger. Many people get involved in anger. That's where violence comes out. And so when people see themselves as they really are in their study of Satanology, they can't handle it. And when they see that uh, oftentimes jealous streaks and everything else come out because it's been exposed. They're in his system. He seeks to frustrate the will of God with regard to your life. That's Satan. He seeks to frustrate the will of God for your life. First of all, he seeks to frustrate the mental will of God. Number one, Satan seeks to frustrate the mental will of God for you. We'll just have one long one today since we got started late. He seeks to frustrate the will of God with regard to your life. Number one, the mental will of God. That's Bible doctrine. And of course he seeks to frustrate you learning Bible doctrine. 
Sometimes you simply frustrate yourself because you're distracted by everything in life. All the silly, superficial things in life that are meaningless. Yet people can't understand that they are meaningless because they don't understand what it means to live their life in the light of eternity. They don't have a clue. You can tell them your life is short. You're going to die very soon. Even if you're young and you live to be 100, that's a short amount of time compared to eternity. You're going to die. Your life is short. Not only that, you're going to get old and feeble. You're going to go from pretty to ugly. Handsome to ugly. Although men usually age more gracefully. But as a woman, usually you go from pretty to ugly. Or pretty ugly anyway. So that's... Uh, and men do the same. And so that's... Uh, you go away from the mental will of God. That is Bible doctrine. Number two. The geographical will of God for you. The geographical will of God. Satan seeks to frustrate the geographical will of God for you. That's Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 2.18. The geographical will of God is... Satan tries to frustrate the geographical will of God for you. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 describes this. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 How Satan frustrates the geographical will of God. You see, Satan might hear, missionaries are going to India now. There seems to be great positive volition in India. What's he do? Tries to shut it down. Same thing he did with Paul. Tried to shut it down. And succeeded. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. He tried several times. But... Satan stopped us. Note he doesn't say God. Satan. When God stops you, you just say, well, that's the will of God. Apostle Paul here is saying, Satan stopped us. So he tries to keep you out from the geographical will of God. Now you would say, wouldn't God overrule, of course. But the fact is, Satan didn't want him to go to Thessalonia. That's all. Now, if God was going to uh, make Paul go, he would have uh, he would have said, "Satan, stand out of the way. This is going to happen." But either way, Satan was there trying to stop him, and that's the point. He tries to frustrate the geographical will of God. Number three, he tries to frustrate the operational will of God for you. The operational will of God. The operational will of God for you is to be humble. James 4, 7 through 8. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He tries to frustrate the operational will of God. He tries to keep you out of fellowship through arrogance. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Rebound and purify your heart, you double-minded flushing out the garbage in your stream of consciousness. Galatians 5, 7 says, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? Who cut in on you? Satan. Trying to frustrate the op operational will of God for you. And remember, Satan uses his system to do this. He doesn't have to necessarily do it himself. Many times he, he cannot do it himself. He is not omnipresent. He uses his system. And he uses people under his system to do what? Shut the gates on those who might want to show up to Bible class. To force people out who might want to come to Bible class. That is Satan frustrating the operational will of God for an individual or individual believers. And it's phenomenal. Some of the emails I get and people just don't understand. And they question what I've done and they question everything else and they just don't know. 
They have no clue what went on, and yet they think they know. Go ahead and be mad. I'll be blessed. But you just don't know. You don't know what the operational will of God is. And you don't, well, obviously, many people don't know what the operational will of God is, and many people try to keep people out of the operational will of God because they're on the wrong side. They're in Satan's system. Satan tried, number four, Satan tries to neutralize consistent doctrinal perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine. Satan tries to neutralize consistent, <laughs> Satan tries to neutralize consistent doctrinal perception daily. Satan tries to neutralize daily doctrinal perception, metabolization, and application through several principles. We will note many of these principles. Satan tries to neutralize us. Neutralize believers. Point one. He uses worry. Worry will neutralize you in the spiritual life faster than you can say worry. Worry. Fear. Anxiety. We're the most anxiety-ridden country in the world, yet the wealthiest. Go figure. You think a monetary security will wipe out your anxiety? No, it won't. We're the wealthiest country in the world, and yet we're probably the most worried people in the world. Money won't make you not worried. If anything, you'll be worried about where to put it, how to save it, how to invest it, how many people are trying to get a piece from you, etc., not going to make you happy. If anything, intensify your worry, your fear, your anxiety, mental attitude sins, and reaction to historical disaster. Satan will try to neutralize your doctrinal perception through number one, worry, fear, anxiety, mental attitude sins, and reaction to historical disaster. When you don't have the doctrine and historical disaster occurs, you'll react to it and say, why, God, did you let this happen to us? I'll tell you why before it even happens to our country, but it will. You were arrogant! You were too arrogant to sit down, shut your mouth, and listen to doctrine, and you failed to become a Pleroma believer. You could do it better. You knew better. You were right. I was wrong. And, then, and you decided to get competitive instead of sticking with the spiritual life. And I'm not talking about a specific person. I'm talking about all of Christendom. All the Baptists and all the Methodists and all of those. All emotionalism and competitivism. And I'm not talking about one person. Idiots write me. I know who you were talking about. Yeah, you probably. And everyone else who's an idiot who doesn't understand the Word of God and definitely, and the reason why, they don't understand humility. Humility is the basis for growing in grace and in knowledge. The first act of humility for the Christian is rebound. And that's the first problem-solving device. And why is that the first act of humility? You have admitted you were wrong to God. Before you were saying, I was not wrong. I was right to get angry. Then you say to yourself, no, I was wrong. Who did I wrong? God. Doesn't matter who else you wronged in the process. You wronged God. So you name that sin to God. Keep moving. Keep plugging along. But we don't have humility in this country. As a result, historical disaster after historical disaster will occur. Do you know what the Iranians are doing? They're laughing at us. Today they laughed at us. Well, they rejected the UN resolution. Basically, they said, ha ha, what you going to do now? And then the great religious re leader over there of their great religion, in quotes, their great religion of Islam, even Bush has said that, not a great religion. There is no such thing as a great religion. There is Christianity, which is not a religion, because it's faith alone and Christ alone. Religion is the opposite. We will study more in detail that when we get to evil fact we might as well have two messages so I want to get to evil don't lower your head you'll get enough sleep 
worry, fear, anxiety, mental attitude sins in reaction to historical disaster. Lack of humility will cause historical disaster. Then you'll stay up all night biting your fingernails. You wouldn't do that if you would have listened to the word. Point two, getting the believer to be disobedient to the word and the pastor's authority involved in teaching it. I didn't write that. Oh, some of you would think I did if you're listening anymore. Getting the believer to be disobedient to the word and the pastor's authority involved in teaching it. That's what Satan tries to do. And Satanology irritated people because I went a half hour over one time. Be irritated! You didn't even have to drive to church would have take, which would have taken a half hour for you. Be irritated. That's satanic. It's the word of God. The word of God is far more important than watching cars go round and round in circles on a racetrack. And I know people have missed class to watch cars go nearong, 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 nearong. And they watch that like morons. And they're so sick, they're probably waiting for somebody to crash and die. And that's what... Oh, a wreck, yeah. How exciting. Not exciting at all. People stay out of Bible class for all types of reasons. Let me watch this other show. Let me watch... Uh, women usually don't like to watch... Which often makes me wonder if men are not... If women are not smarter than a lot of men. Women will watch something emotional to titillate their... Uh, emotions and make them cry or something else. I can understand that. That's a bit better than nyeow, nyeow. It's insanity. But they, whatever you put above the Word of God is insanity. Word of God is number one. So getting the believer to be disobedient to the Word and the pastor's authority is in, and to get disobedient against the pastor's authority is involved in all of this. Because when you reject the pastor, you reject the doctrine he's teaching. When you reject the pastor's authority, you're rejecting the doctrine he's teaching. And if he's wrong on the doctrine, leave. If he's right on the doctrine, shut your mouth and listen. Now I've asked people before, well you're complaining about these little things, but have I said anything wrong doctrinally? Well, no, you haven't. Then why are you talking to me right now? The purpose is doctrine. To learn the word of God. And Satan tries to take you away from it through his system. Well, he may personally do it as well in a few cases. But in most cases, since Satan is not omnipresent, he'll do it through his system. And once you're in his system, you are rebellious. Not only will you be rebellious, but uh, lots of other people are rebellious. Now, number three, ignore the doctrine you've learned. That's found in First Chronicles 21.1. Number three, you'll simply ignore the doctrine that you've learned. You know what that means? Lack of application. Learned a lot of doctrine, but you don't apply it. You could probably spout out 1 Peter 5, 7 on the top of your head and don't never apply it. Cast all your anxieties on him for he cares for you. Yet you run around worried, full of anxiety. What am I going to do? This and that and the other. Well, you're not applying the doctrine. And you're out of fellowship. You've got to apply the doctrine you learned. What, what use is it to know it and not use it? What use, it? what use is it to have money and not spend it? None. What, you, what use is it to have spiritual capital and not spend it? None. It's replenishable. Always. Number four. Satan destroys the believer's focus. Satan destroys the believer's focus. He uses both cosmic one, neglect of doctrine, and cosmic two, rejection of doctrine, to keep the believer from occupation with Christ. We're the United States of entertainment. That's cosmic one. In that people have chosen entertainment over the word of God. 
They go to silly churches where they can be entertained and eat chicken on Sunday, and that's all they think about church. And then all through the week they act like morons, because they are. And all through the week they get in fights with their husband and wife and get in divorces, etc. Ad infinitum. And this is a client nation. No, we're about to lose it. Just look around. We are a client nation to God. We represent Jesus Christ as a nation. <laughs> it should make you cringe to look around at all the believers who care not for the word of God. They don't care for this. They never even give, give a thought to what's in here. Oh, they give a thought to morality, maybe. And then they adjust themselves to some moral system. And they say, I'm holy because I'm moral. And they're not holy at all. They're self-righteous. Spirituality is the filling of the Holy Spirit. And no one understands that today. Very few people understand that. Very few people even understand the filling of the Holy Spirit is an absolute. You're either filled with the Spirit or not. Satanology brings that out very clear. You're either in the cosmic system or not. If you're in the cosmic system, you're not filled with the Spirit. If you're in the divine dinosphere, you're filled with the Spirit. Period. It has to do with whether you're spiritual or not. Not moral. Now when you're filled with the Spirit, of course morality comes along with it. But the, the morality is not the spiritual way of life. You can be the most, most moral person on the face of the earth and be completely unspiritual because you're not filled with the Spirit. It doesn't matter how moral you are. God is not impressed with your morality. Our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. So Satan destroys the believer's focus through distraction and through reaction to doctrine. Number five. Satan causes you to get your eyes on people. That's found all throughout the Bible. I won't give you all the verses. But Satan causes you to get your eyes on people. Rapport with people over rapport with God. Rapport with people over rapport with God. Nothing wrong with rapport with people. Except the more I grow in grace and in knowledge, the more I understand it's better just to have rapport with God and let people be idiots. And that might sound arrogant, but I don't care anymore. Because rapport with God comes first, and then rapport with people. And if you don't have any rapport with people, it might be best for you. Get your relationship with God straightened out first. Then rapport with people. Churches today emphasize rapport with people. And they call it Christian fellowship, and it's not Christian fellowship at all. Christian fellowship is rapport with God. It's when you dine with God, when you sup with God, as it were, when you sup with Jesus Christ. Have supper, sup, Old Testament. Not Old Testament, but old English term. It's relationship with God that is paramount. So Satan causes you to get your eyes on people. Number six, he causes you to get your eyes on self. Once you have your eyes on people and once you have your eyes on self, you're finished. You're outside of fellowship. You know what you base your whole life on? Comparison with people. You compare yourself to others, etc. Your whole life becomes a comparison to other people. And that's the big problem. It's a big problem in churches and at work and everywhere else. You get your eyes on self, you get your eyes on people. Number seven, he causes you to get your eyes on things. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, things includes money. He causes you to get your eyes on things. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. And probably when I go through these, you say, he causes you to get your eyes on self. Yeah, that's so-and-so. That person sits beside me. He causes you to get your eyes on other people. Oh, yeah, that's so-and-so. And then the other person is sitting there cringing. 
And then I get to he gets he makes you get your eyes on things and money, and then you say, Oh yeah, that's so and so and then the other person cringes. It's for you, all of us. All of us get our eyes on people at some point. It's called the old sin nature, it takes control and we get worried about what people think. We all do it. All of us. And we get our eyes on self, self pity. We all do it. It's not for you to think about someone else. We all get our eyes on things. Money. Money's included there, but some people really don't understand that things come from money. They just like things. And they don't understand it takes money to buy things, but they just love things. It's called a woman who goes on a shopping spree. No thought of money. Money's nothing. It's just the things. That's all. But then you could just say, well, I like the money. Forget the things. I like the money. And with the money, I'll buy a big thing. It's all the same stuff, though. Just different personality. That's all. It's the old sin nature with a different personality. And uh, that's uh, the biggest cause of divorce is number one, mother-in-law, number two, money. So he causes you to get your eyes on self, on people, on things. And the last one, Satan sponsors Christian activism. Satan sponsors it. Satan sponsors Christian activism. Why? He would like nothing better than for you to go around and whitewash his world. He knows his world isn't too pretty. And since he's the ruler of this world, he needs some workers, some little busy bees with busy body noses. You see, in my church, the women never challenge me. They have to use their husbands to do it. And that's, well, you can understand why. Because they know they won't get away with it. Because, again, I think women are smart. <laughs> Some of you look confused. What I'm saying is a woman will look and say, I know I won't get any, I can't get anything through to this guy. Besides, he's a bit in, uh, intimidating. There's no, I can't talk to this fellow, but uh, I know how to get someone else to do it for me. Smart, see? Conniving. Thinking. And then the husband in his arrogance, all puffed up, yeah, I'll do it for you. Anything for you, darling. What a waste. Satan sponsors Christian activism. He tries to get the believer to become involved in the improvement of his world, Satan's world, through becoming occupied with temporal solutions. What are temporal solutions? Political. He gets believers to get preoccupied with political solutions. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. You're free to be here and listen to the word. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Socialist, Communist. You're free to come in here and listen to the word. Now, if you're a Socialist and Communist, you'll get straightened out if you keep listening. Because that's part of activism. But in terms of Democrat, Republican, guess what? Democrats have old sin natures and live in the cosmic system. Republicans have old sin natures and live in the cosmic system. Republicans are just as influenced by the cosmic system as Democrats. Independents are just as influenced by the cosmic system as Democrats and Republicans. There, there is a difference in the political parties that I will note, and something that you'll understand if, if you've already gotten there, you already understand, and that has to do with divine establishment. Usually one party will favor divine establishment over another. In that, divine establishment includes a strong military. You figure for yourself which party favors that. The political party will favor lower taxes, smaller government. I don't think either party favors that anymore. Maybe the lower taxes part, but guess what? You can lower taxes all you want. As long as government grows, it, 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 had, it has no effect. You can learn that in economics. It's, it's something, it's a phenomenon. Do you know that the government doesn't need to tax us one bit in order to make money for itself? Why? Because we have a fiat system. You know, you, and anybody could do this. A genius could get up and do it, I guess, and say, you know what? No more tax for anybody. Just print the money. It's the same thing, though. Why? Inflation. When you print the money, it causes inflation. 
the same concept though so what I'm telling you is when you grow the government the more you spend and the more money you print doesn't matter if they lower taxes or not inflation will kick in that's all I'm saying so you could uh, put taxes at zero and just spend like a maniac and inflation will go through the roof you'll be paying taxes Anyway, that might be a little too deep for some people. But that's okay. It's not an economics class. Let's get back to Satanology. I heard that through a very, uh, very smart professor. Not one I had. I heard him on the radio. An economic professor. And boy, did he ever make a lot of sense. And it's true. And he was saying, look, everybody's worried about taxes. Taxes aren't the real big thing. You're enslaved to these entitlements. And the government's spending right and left on this entitlement and that entitlement. And he said the government can make taxes zero, but as long as you keep government big and government spends all this money anyway, you're going to pay for it. Nothing's free is what he was saying. Nothing is free. The only thing free in this life, salvation and the spiritual life. That's it. Everything else in this life has to be paid for. That's just part of economics. So the last one again, Satan sponsors Christian activism. He tries to improve his world by becoming occupied with temporal solutions, such as improving the environment or the greatest good for the greatest number, that's socialism, or social action or the social gospel, help the poor, etc. The welfare state. And temporal solutions to man's problem, whatever, excuse me, problems, whatever they may be. Temporal solutions to man's problems, whatever they may be. Now in Ephesians 4.27 it says, Stop giving opportunity to the devil. Now what does this mean? This means we're to be on the defenses against Satan and stop giving opportunity to him to go on the offensive. We are on the defensive. We are never commanded to be on the offensive against Satan. We're on the defeat defensive. Never, ever to be on the offensive against Satan. The, be, the Ephesian believers at this point had done something strange and they were taking offensive action against Satan. Therefore, Paul commanded them to stop doing what they were already doing. Ephesians 4.27 And stop. Stop doing what you're already doing giving opportunity to the devil by going on the offensive through what? Christian activism. They considered it offensive. They considered it offensive against the devil, but that's what the devil wanted them to do. Paul said, stop it. Stop going into activism. The Ephesians did like uh, Americans would do. They got involved in politics, temporal solutions. We'll solve this problem this way, and we'll solve the, another problem another way. So believers serve Satan through many things like Christian activism and that plays right into the hands of Satan. And we give opportunity to Satan in two ways. Number one, through the failure to execute the unique spiritual life of the church age and to reach Pleroma status. Number one, through the failure to execute the unique spiritual life of the church age and reach Pleroma status. Number two, to live a life in perpetual carnality in the cosmic system and to die that sin face to face with death. That is giving opportunity to the devil. Number one, through failure to execute, execute the unique spiritual life of the church age and to reach Pleroma status. So what does number one mean? America is in trouble! That's what it means. We're a client nation to God and how many believers are living the spiritual life how many believers know what the spiritual life is? Very few. An extraordinarily few, a number. Few. Extraordinarily few people understand how to be spiritual. An extraordinarily few who even attend doctrinal churches knows what it means to be spiritual. Oh, they'll go around and claim positive volition, but they're no positive than uh, the negative side of a battery. They're not positive. I had to come up with something quick, so that's what I said. <laughs> if it sounds stupid, well, I might agree with you. Number two, to live a life in per 
perpetual carnality in the cosmic system. Then you'll die the sin face to face with death. And why? You didn't know what it meant to be spiritual. Now what happens when collectively as a client nation we are a nation with many, many believers. I know that 97 percent, 95 to 97 percent of Americans believe in God. Doesn't mean they're saved, but I just know that we have a higher percentage of people who believe in God anyway to start with. 95 to 97 percent. Can't remember which. Uh, but in terms of believers, I don't know the exact number. We'll, we'll, we'll never know the exact number, but I guess it's been estimated 100 million at least proclaim it. There are some who will never proclaim it but are saved and there are those who proclaim it and aren't saved. So who knows? But I know this country has a lot more believers than any other. And when the resurrection occurs, if it occurs while this country's here pretty soon, then this country will lose a lot of its population, especially in the South. There will be a lot of ghost towns in the South. There will be a lot of small towns who went to the same church and they were all believers and boof, they're gone. Ghost towns everywhere. Then all the unbelievers for the first half of the tribulation can have fun looking at ghost towns and stealing from their houses. Might as well. It's no, no use to anyone else anymore. So Satan has a strategy concerning the unbeliever. He has one concerning the believer and he has one concerning the unbeliever. I think we have gone over this before. It, it does sound awfully familiar, but that's fine. Number one, he, blind, he blinds the unbeliever's mind to the gospel. And he motivates every form of unbelieving reversionism. Unbelieving reversionism was taught in 2 Peter chapter 2. That is where the gospel was given to an unbeliever. He was pulled out of the cosmic system for a short time in order to understand the gospel. He rejected it and went right back into the cosmic system. And his latter form was worse than his first form. Meaning he first rejected the first category of truth, the divine establishment, after he received the gospel, understood the gospel, and rejected the gospel, he went ahead and rejected category one truth as well, and became a liberal. Went from a nice conservative young man, red-blooded red American man, unbeliever, to a flaming liberal atheist, etc. Why? Rejected the gospel. So that is a way that Satan attacks the unbeliever in reversionism. They build up scar tissue. We will note that when we get back to Exodus chapter 5, the scar tissue of the soul of the unbeliever. When Satan cannot deceive through good and evil, he uses religion. And we will note Satan's deception, and we will note religion, and we will note good and evil. And that may be in the next 45 minutes. We'll have a break. And then 45 more minutes, since it is getting a bit late. 45 more minutes. And then we'll move to the doctrine of evil. Evil. Well, we're still on Satanology. But the policy of Satan is what? Evil. And uh, some people might have an idea of what evil is. I know that most people's ideas are completely wrong. They think of evil as a murderer. Well, yes, that's a sin. And yes, it, uh, it's violence, so it can go under the category of evil, but they would never look at a philanthropist, someone who gives away all their money to the poor, and say, that person's evil. They'd never say that. But remember, the tree in the middle of the garden was a what? The tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. Good. You know what that means? Adam and Eve didn't know how to be good. You know what that means? Good is part of Satan's system. Good is part of Satan's system. Lewis Berry Schaefer taught that very well in page 100 of volume 2. And also page 118 through 120 of volume 2. Which I cannot locate! I'm just playing it. I'm just playing on that one. I'm not upset. <laughs> she got scared. I'm just playing. No, that's that's. Uh, I can't locate it. But anyway, if I could locate, I would read that passage for you. But uh, if you happen to be one of the few lucky ones to have that, look it up. It's phenomenal. 
and he talks about how Satan incorporates all the good in the world, and yet he's evil. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and knowledge and learn the wily ways of our enemy, the devil, in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ's name, amen.